Hello, welcome to Matters of Decorum. I'm Scott Corum. This is what matters to me. Uh, there is a distinction that I need to make. It is an obvious distinction to some, but it is important for the conversation we're about to have. And that is the distinction between a player and a character. The character or player character is the fictional construct, the fictional being that is represented by the character sheet, whose uh, random chance is decided by dice, who is controlled by the player, uh, who is represented on the table when you're playing a role-playing game. The player is the person who shows up from their day-to-day -day life, sits down at this table, pulls a character out of a folder, and makes decisions for them. Uh, has created them and written them like an author creates a character in a book, and who rolls the dice to see what random chance says about their successes and failures. Uh, I've got a lot of role-playing games up here. They all contain some system for increasing the level of difficulty for the character. Uh, you assign higher numbers of difficulty. You assign different classes of difficulty. You increase the uh, durability or the damage done of the opposition or both I, I like doing both um, you give them more difficult traps to solve harder opponents to beat more complex situations to deal with and unravel there are rules in every book uh, for how is this situation more difficult for that character than that situation was and how do you make a situation more difficult down the road? Uh, making things more difficult for the characters is a part of the Game Master's job. The Game Master needs to see to it that the characters are challenged, that there is something that they have to overcome, some form of opposition, some difficulty, that they have to get past in order to advance, to become better as individuals, and to complete the quest or campaign or storyline that they are currently involved in. Um, good stories are told through the use of conflict, and it is the game master's job to see to it that the characters on the table are experiencing conflict of one type or another, often several types all at once. There are a few different ways that the player can experience more or less difficulty in the process of playing the character. Some good, some bad. Um, when it comes to bad ways to make the gaming experience more difficult for the player, well, like I said, there's a lot of different games up here, and games have different levels of complexity and difficulty. Uh, rules light systems like Fate or TFOS or uh, Savage Worlds to some extent, um, they, have, they don't have a lot of rules to learn. Powered by the Apocalypse comes to mind too. Not a lot of rules to learn. Uh, a lot of it's just going off a concept. Uh, you can absorb their mechanics very quickly, and you don't have to keep a lot of page references or charts in your head. You, you've got a few rules, you can boil it down to a page or two, and you can just go. Uh, you can pick it up over an afternoon or two, and uh, you, can, or you can just look at the person next to you for the next five weeks, and you can learn easily. The systems are not difficult to pick up, easy system, low level of difficulty for the player. They get harder from there. Um, older editions of Dungeons Dragons, older editions of anything are just inherently harder. A lot of times because older games had a lot more focus on simulation and less focus on uh, the flow of a game or a session. So there's a lot more calculations to do and a lot more math 
and a lot more rules to see to it. You get to uh, more modern editions of Dungeons and Dragons uh, that have more rules even though they're streamlined, or you get to something like GURPS that has a rule for just about everything covered over, well, now two books uh, that you need to to be able to flip through and reference constantly. Uh, how far can you jump? How far can you fall? What's the damage for doing this? Uh, what are you, You've got a, a hundred of different abilities to be able to keep track of. Um, to things like the hero system or the old games design workshop games, uh, space opera, villains and vigilantes, which uh, involve higher orders of mathematics to figure out how your character can do things and how much damage they do. Uh, this is not good difficulty assignment for the player. This is just making, you're going to filter out a certain level of player. There are players who are not going to want to put that much effort into uh, a role-playing game. So, uh, past a certain point, it's just homework. And as m a good game master can make any game fun, but if the system is too cumbersome for those particular players, uh, you'll, you'll always have players who kind of dig that, want to dig in, and who want that level of difficulty, but I don't think you'll find those players are in the majority. So system complexity, uh, game complexity. The harder the game is, the more difficult it is for the player, and that is not a good level of game complexity. That That's, you know, pick the system that works for your group as a whole, but, uh, but don't rely on that game system to be the thing making the player's lives difficult. Character complexity, on the other hand, is a very good way to introduce a higher level of difficulty for the player. Sometimes a player wants a more complicated character. Uh, we have tremendous examples throughout all of literature of wonderfully complicated characters. Darth Vader is a fairly deep and complicated character. Um, a, a number of the trope characters in Star Wars have their levels of depth and complexity. Uh, throughout literature, we have characters with tragic flaws or deep secrets or both who have physical adversities to overcome or mental adversities to overcome. Um, and all of these things make a character more difficult to play, but that is a level of difficulty that the player can seek out and engage in. I want to play a character who has this problem. I would like to explore this issue through how I play this character. Um, challenging social norms or political norms, um, or ableism or gender issues, all of these things, uh, if you want to represent that in a character, uh, to have a character that is more complex, rich, and deep to play, uh, it is another level of difficulty, but it is a wonderful thing to deal with. It stretches your abilities and opens up your mind a little bit sometimes. Sometimes this can take a little out-of-game research. Sometimes you're looking up, well, what do people who have these difficulties deal with? And how am I going to represent that sitting down at a table and rolling dice? And there's something fascinating about uh, the difference between the difficulties for the character and those particular self-imposed difficulties for the players that they are self-imposed. The difficulties that the character faces in their situations, the opposition that the world is giving them, that is the game master's job, to produce and provide those levels of difficulty and opposition for the character. The difficulty in how that, uh, the level of difficulty that you have in playing that character is entirely up to the player. Now, the Game Master does need to enforce that difficulty, 
If there's a flaw on the character sheet, something that makes the character's life harder, the Game Master needs to make sure that that flaw comes into play at some point. But, uh, what difficulties that player faces playing that character? Well, you chose that character. You chose those difficulties. Uh, a Game Master might suggest you have a character with those difficulties, but the choice is ultimately should always be entirely up to the player. Uh, you don't want to deal with a particular issue with playing your character, don't do it. Uh, something seems like it might be triggering or otherwise unpleasant to deal with, that you have a character who has an issue that you don't really want to deal with, don't put that on your character sheet. Don't put it on your character sheet unless you want to deal with it because the Game Master's job is to make sure you got to deal with it. In a point buy system or in a, uh, a, a uh, even odd exchange system or uh, say uh, Advanced White Wolf 3rd Edition where you can take a character advantage if you take a character disadvantage. Um, merits and flaws and victory, advantages and disadvantages in uh, Steve Jackson Games GURPS, uh, you might want to throw some things in your character sheet that would be difficult for you to deal with, but you don't think they'll ever actually come into play. And as a game master, you got to make sure those things come into play. Like, well, I need the points. I need the merits. If I, if I want to get these advantages, I need to have X number of disadvantages just so I can afford to have these advantages on my character sheet. You pick those carefully. It can be a good, ex I, have, I have played characters who had disadvantages on their sheet that as it turned out, I did not properly envision how those were going to come into play. And it was a very good game master who displayed to me, I didn't want those there. Um, but I had to deal with them anyway, and it was an experience. It was a level of difficulty that I hadn't anticipated. Uh, that was not the game master's fault. That was mine. That was my fault for putting those things on that character sheet without really thinking, well, I'm not going to deal with this. How often is this going to come up? Well, it's going to come up. And should. Um, but again, player's choice. There are plenty of folks who just want to show up, sit down at a table, put their character down, start rolling dice, beat up a bunch of orcs, collect their experience points and treasure, and go home. Nothing wrong with that. That is a perfectly good use of the role-playing game format. You go. You murder all the orcs you can. Um, you you want to talk about stuff at the tavern, or go on that quest into the dungeon, and, and argue about treasure with people. Have fun. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that. If you want to stretch a little bit as a player, if you want to dig into your ability to convey something that is different from how you normally see the world, that's an amazing challenge. I've got a background in theater. I'm the, the, the associates in theater arts from, uh, from Merrimack in 86, and more years in educational theater than you can shake a stick at. I like acting. I like taking a character who has some differences, uh, a different way of talking, a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at things. Um, I've got a problem. It has come to be known as the Scots Wandering Accent Syndrome. I will start with an accent with a character. I can do a couple of accents. I don't stay on them, though, because I will wander into other accents on my own. The thing of it is, is that not only am I wandering into other accents, but people next to me start speaking in the accent that I started with. Or they'll pick up one of my accents that will, res will resonate them, and, and the accents will wander around the room. It's a, it's a curse. 
you want to play an evil character in a party of good characters. That's a challenge because not only do you have to uh, look at things through the lens of evil, but you have to play the double role of someone who is actually evil, pretending to be good, trying to do evil things in the background without the good people knowing about it. Um, you to play an alien character, someone who is not human, who does not look at things the way that humans do, and might not even have the human senses to do it. Gerps Lensman, amazing for that, um, because there are characters who have no relationship to humanity whatsoever. <coughs> Pardon. The number of ways in which you can stretch at your, your point of view and your ability to play a particular character is as broad as the number of people out there who are who want to play, or even more so. Should you challenge yourself as a player? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is that ability to step into another point of view and uh, follow it, to to see how it goes. To, it's one thing to write a story from another point of view because you're in control of everything that's going on as you're writing that story. In a role-playing game, you're not in control of those events. You can try to exert some control over your aspect of those events, but there is someone else there putting those things in your path, and you're going to have to do things from that point of view. You are not anticipating if the game master's on the ball. You're going to have to take care of situations and interactions through that character's point of view that you might need a minute to think about that you're going to have to really stretch and imagine how that happens that's a tremendous exercise it's one reason that I enjoy game mastering so much because a lot of the things you come across will not have a recognizable point of view I had a this a few weeks ago uh, the Paladin of Maradin, Dwarven Paladin of Maradin, had a long argument with the mountain trying to make the mountain care about uh, the plight of someone who's trapped inside it. And the mountain didn't care, because mountains don't care. Mountains sit there, and they watch the sun rise, and watch it fall, and the seasons pass, and they don't care. They're a mountain. They don't have to care. They have not been imbued with a fuck to give. Uh, that was a very long conversation because the person playing the Dwarven Paladin played them very well, and he was as stubborn as the mountain. So there was a lot of give and take there. It took up maybe a little bit too much of the table time, but I'm not going to be too upset because it was a genuine interaction from points of view that you don't see too often. Mind you, there is an additional challenge involved in playing a character who has an extremely different point of view, uh, because sometimes those characters can fall outside the realm of people who would involve themselves in what the rest of the group is doing, and that's a very important balance to strike, because you don't want to make your character so difficult and different that they're no longer a part of this game. Um, having a certain amount of party cohesion is really important. Even if you've got that evil person, they've got to at least be able to pretend to be a member of that party. Even if you have that loner off on the side, they've got to be able to coordinate with the rest of the party. And having that level of interaction while retaining that cohesion. Uh, is another level of challenge. The the player can find themselves challenged that third way. You gotta fit. Your character has to fit and you have to operate with the rest of that table. And that can be, it, it might sometimes seem at cross odds to having a character who is inherently conceptually difficult to play. But you gotta do it anyway. 
uh, because having that character not fit into that and it means you're sitting at the corner of the table waiting for the game master to get around back to your game while they're running everyone else's at the same time it's not worth it the role-playing game in my opinion is a one of the best cooperative activities that a group of people can engage in and to exclude your character from the action and interaction of the group uh, is that's going a little bit too far in seeking that challenge and that is diminishing the overall experience this is the second time i recorded this this and i went super ranty and specific the first time so uh i'm trying to be a little bit more sedate about it now play with the group Are there particular advantages to giving yourself these forms of difficulty as a player? Hell yes, there are. Uh, there is a value in broadening the mind, in looking at things from a different perspective. Taking a step back and examining stuff that you have looked at all your life through a different set of eyes. It is enlightening and it encourages a certain degree of empathy understanding that your point of view is not the only point of view that other point of views can not only exist but be valid it's a moral exercise an ethical exercise an exercise in walking a few miles in someone else's shoes. Just like, just like swinging a sword or shooting a gun in a role-playing game gives you that vicarious experience. And you might grab a shenai stick and take it to a park and see about actually swinging something, or study firearms, or look at the statistics and the history behind these things. Uh, just like those experiences in a role-playing game can lead you to some actual learning and knowledge. God, most of the people I know who play games of this sort uh, either walked into it with a certain amount of knowledge of combat and the, the, the equipment thereof or the history of it um, or pick some up as a result of being involved in the hobby. Just like that is a thing when you start examining things through other points of view, other mindsets or philosophies looking at things through another person's eyes can also lead you to a certain amount of enlightenment of study of research of looking into how those thoughts and feelings come about even if it's just so that you can portray them in a reasonable fashion it's not entirely an academic exercise but it's not entirely not an academic exercise either it's never a bad thing to spend a little while looking through a different set of eyes well thank you for following me along on this particular rant through uh through difficulty classes uh if you like the video give me a thumbs up if you didn't like the video give me a thumbs down feedback is feedback if you uh have your own experiences of Playing, a, a finding a, a new way to make your playing experience difficult, a point of view that you enjoy looking through. If there's other things you'd like to hear me talk about or other subjects that you would like me to cover, leave me a comment below. Uh, I will love getting your comment. You will love leaving me one. If you haven't subscribed to my videos yet, why not? My videos are awesome. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you do hit the subscribe button, hit the little notification bell next to it so you're alerted when my videos become available. If you would like to support the channel in a more substantial fashion, I invite you to hit me up my Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash scottquorum, and consider donating. Absolutely anything helps. It allows me to make better videos more often. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. I'm Scott Quorum. This is what has mattered to me, and I will see you next time on the next Matters of Decorum.